Hi everyone, Tim here. I'm recording this video as uh, the promised sort of supplement to our lectures this week on the chapter 3 material. Um, there's still a, a couple hanging threads here I want to get through kind of quickly um, and then uh, you'll be in a position to have all the material we've talked about that's relevant for doing the homework exercises in preparation for having our homework day on Monday. So that's what I kind of wanted to still shoot for and I'm going to use this supplemental video just to like get us where we need to be. So um, it's also an opportunity for me to tackle another couple things that I forgot to mention over the course of this week's lectures. I was reflecting on it. I was like, oh yeah, I sh should have mentioned that. Um, they're little, little things. So <clears throat> first one, soundness. <laughs> I can't believe I forgot about this one. But uh, we spent all the time talking about validity. I, I think I just assumed that we had also talked about soundness, but we hadn't. And there's not too much to say here. Soundness is not a totally new type of concept. An argument is sound as long as it is both valid and has all actually true premises. So if you took those two standards for good arguments that I've been discussing in class, having actually true premises and having a good support relation, but you cash out that good support relation standard in terms of validity, then you've got a sound argument. So basically, sound arguments are good arguments, <laughs> which is why the term is a useful one to know. It, it means that the argument is doing everything that we could ask of it to do uh, to, to give us adequate defense for a conclusion here, uh, to be justified in holding the conclusion. Sound arguments have necessarily true conclusions, and that's what's kind of really cool about them. And they're necessarily true, they have necessarily true con conclusions because if the argument is valid, that's like saying if the premises are true, then the conclusion must be true. And then to say that the, the argument has all true premises is to say that first thing is happening. So if all the premises are true, then the conclusion must be true. The premises are true, therefore conclusion is true. So that's the cool thing about soundness. There's actually a version, um, a similar term, for describing what happens when you have all true premises and you have a strong support relation. So that inductive standard of strength being used to evaluate um, how good of a support relation it is instead of validity. And that uh, strong arguments that also have all true premises are called cogent arguments um, instead of sound. So there's soundness and cogency depending on whether you're using validity as the standard to evaluate the support relation or inductive strength. But don't worry too much about the inductive strength and cogency stuff yet. Validity and soundness is <clears throat> what I'm asking for you to understand at this point. Um, and we'll deal with the rest of that stuff later um, after the first exam. So I want to talk about that. I also want to give just a little brief tip about discounting that I forgot to mention. I've been trying to give you advice as we've been talking about these different annotations for like how you can double check on your thinking or your answers and, and feel confident in what you're doing, that it's not just a, a kind of intuitive gut call, <laughs> but you're like, yes, I think that's the right answer. It feels right and I know it's right because this is what, you know, whatever that this is. So with discounting, the thing that you can do is since discounting is anticipating or addressing some kind of objection and dismissing it without giving an argument, every case of discounting needs to have some objection that's being dismissed. So if you think discounting is happening, ask yourself, okay, what's the objection being discounted? If you can't come up with one, then that might not be discounting. You would have to be careful about it. But if you are able to come up with it, you're like, oh yeah, it's this argument. Then you can feel really confident in attributing discounting to that part of that sentence, that phrase or words that do that work. Um, but <clears throat> that's what you want to listen for. There's always got to be an objection that's being dismissed. It might be implicit. You know, it might not be explicitly stated. But there, if you can pick up on some kind of sensitivity of a concern, some basis for doubt, that the opponent could have, that the person is sort of being like, boo, 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 boo. then, then you, then that can be some confirmation for you. The other thing I wanted to mention that's connected with discounting is um, the exercise uh, number seven from chapter three, the one that's having you do the identifying the annotations, uh, but not including the evaluative stuff yet. 
Um, it has a couple wacky instructions to it. Um, actually, let me pull it up here. Just give me one second. Yeah, here we go. Um, so, <clears throat> exercise seven says, for each of the number of words or expressions in the following sentences, indicate whether it's an argument marker, an assuring term, a guarding term, a discounting term, or none of these. None is always an option. For each argument marker, specify uh, what the conclusion and the reasons are. You don't need to do this, but I do want you to identify whether it's an argument marker for a conclusion or an argument marker for a premise. And then it also says, for each discounting term, specify which criticism is being discounted and what the response is. You don't have to do that either. Um, I just want you to do the annotations. If you, uh, like I said, it, it can be very helpful to confirm your discounting choices by being able to identify the criticism being discounted. But having to do this whole like response, that, that's unnecessary. And in fact, might be a little weird because if discounting is dismissing a criticism without argument, then you'd have to kind of come up with the response. There might not be one that's being offered. So um, it might just be a pure dismissal. So uh, I forgot to mention this in the instructions. I don't know how it's gone by all these years without some student bringing that to my attention, but um, this is not, these instructions are not things that I care about too much. The main thing is being able to pick out conclusion markers, premise markers, assuring, guarding, discounting. That's the, that's the key stuff here. And then uh, we've got one final thing to talk about, and that's evaluative terms. And I'm going to bring up that lecture, the lecture notes for this too. So evaluative language here. Um, this is the final thing that we have to talk about. And like I was mentioning in class um, this morning, uh, we've already talked about this distinction between uh, the two different types of claims that we can make. All claims come in one of two flavors. Either they are descriptive claims or they are normative claims. So descriptive claims are just what is the case, what's going on. What, are, what people usually mean when they talk about facts are descriptive claims. So you, there can be moral facts too. That's part of the debate around um, moral truth. But um, they're, uh, usually when we're talking about facts, we're talking about descriptive states of affairs. How many coins are in my pocket? Who's president of the United States? What's the speed of light? Are there aliens in Alpha Centauri that like Nicolas Cage movies? Like Things like that are all in the world of just how things are. Normative claims are about, in short, how the world ought to be or they have some kind of evaluation. So what I'm calling normative claims, uh, the book is calling evaluative terms, um, because an evaluative terms are just things that, uh, words and phrases that indicate that normative claims are being made. Um, but normativity always has this sort of evaluative component. So good, bad, right, wrong, moral, immoral, evil, virtuous, vicious, appropriate, inappropriate, and even all the stuff about beauty. So something being beautifully beautiful or ugly or stuff like that, that's also normative. Um, but anything in that territory is uh, the things that you're listening for with, which, with trying to pick out evaluative terms. So just like with all these annotations, I'm like, listen for this phenomenon. Well, the phenomenon with evaluative terms is listen for the speaker making normative claims. That's what you want to listen for. And if you hear that happening, then go looking for the language, the words or phrases that indicate uh, a normative meaning, um, that indicate this evaluative content. And there's a few um, little tricks and uh, things to watch out for here with the evaluative terms I want to clue you in on. Um, first off, uh, the really... the 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 really obvious answers here are going to be those basic words I listed before. So if you see someone saying, this thing is good, or that's immoral, or unjust, or murder, or something like that, those kinds of words are pretty obvious um, in terms of that they're making a kind of evaluation. Uh, there's others that are going to be trickier, but that, that's the first thing is like, we can be super explicit with making normative claims. Uh, but we also can do it it, through a lot of implication and with connotation and things like that. So we need to watch out for that. Here's another uh, little wrinkle to be tracking. Just because those explicit words are being used, it doesn't automatically mean that normative judgments are taking place. So usually I do this when I, we're in the classroom and I'd pick on some student here to use as an example. But let's say um, 
I I say, um, well, I'll use my partner here. Uh, she's off at work right now, but my partner's name is Jocelyn. If I said, Jocelyn thinks Nicolas Cage is a terrible actor, I'm using normative language, terrible. Or if I just said, is a bad actor, and make it even more blunt that normative words are being used. But that wouldn't be something to mark as an E positive or E negative sort of thing. It shouldn't be marked, it shouldn't be annotated. And the reason is that I'm not making a normative claim. I'm just stating what Jocelyn's values are or what her evaluations are. I'm not evaluating myself. I'm making a descriptive judgment about what Jocelyn's values are, her evaluation or her opinion about, um, about Nicolas Cage's acting. That's it. Right? Uh, if I said... Nicholas Cage is a bad actor, or I believe Nicholas Cage is a bad actor, then that would be that would be something to mark as evaluative, because it's the speaker who's making a normative judgment here. So that's the key thing to listen for. Um, again, why you can't just use the word bank here, that kind of strategy for how to do those annotations. Um, you got to make sure that the speaker is doing that, and not just attributing those judgments to other people. Okay, that's this that's a key thing. Okay, so what do the more complicated, less straightforward things look like? Well, the book doesn't use this term for it, but um, this is some something philosophers sometimes use for this. Uh, but the book does talk about like spin doctoring. Um, philosophers use this term uh, thick concepts. Thick concepts are concepts that do evaluative and descriptive work simultaneously. So you're doing both things. Um, and there's words and phrases that have these connotations that serve as a vehicle for thick concepts. And let me give you one of my favorite examples. I, I really like this example from the book when it's talking about the this contrast between the invasion of Iraq versus the liberation of Iraq. Both of those phrases describe the same states of affairs. You know, if they're making some kind of claim about the military operations in Iraq. Um, that happened, uh, well, man, it was a little while back now. It feels like yesterday, because that was a, like, a big part of my young adulthood. But anyway, I can't remember right now. I feel bad about that. Um, both of them are describing the same states of affairs, though, the same event that took place. But they're definitely putting some stank on it, either positively or negatively. Like, a liberation, like, that's a good thing. Like, liberations are good. Invasion is like bad. It's violating sovereignty and blah blah blah, right? So uh, there's a lot of times words that will do both, will do double duty, and you got to be watching out for that. Um, this is uh, gets into the territory of conversational implication, and there can be some tough judgment calls that you have to make. Sometimes you have words that do descriptive work, but that really do have loaded connotations to them, but um, it, it's it's kind of something you have to look at contextually to think, you know, do you think the speaker is trying to say that this thing is good or bad or right and wrong or something like that? Or is their intention just to describe? Um, there's some tips I have for you about how you can double check your answers here. If you think something is E positive or E negative, um, you can think about interjecting, especially with the implication cases, think about interjecting after that word or phrase, something like, and that's a good thing, or, and that's a bad thing. So if I talked about, like, oh, I don't know. Um, man, I should have thought of an example here. Um, well, oh, let's just use the ones from the book. I don't have to think up some kooky. Um, so the invasion of Iraq, and that's a bad thing, or the liberation of Iraq, and that's a good thing. Like, those kind of feel natural additions. That's really what you're doing when you're annotating E positive, E negative. You're saying the speaker is saying something is good, something is bad, appropriate, inappropriate, right, wrong, some kind of evaluation. You're attributing that to them when you make that annotation. So you want to make sure the shoe fits, basically. Another thing that you can do for tricky cases is if you think it's evaluative because of some that stank you smell on it, like the connotations on that word or phrase, um, that would have some that would elicit an evaluative thought by association. If you're not sure that they're intending to make that association or connotation, 
Think about whether there is some other way that they could have articulated the descriptive point in more neutral language. So if there's an easy option for how to like explain something or describe something without any connotation, then that it makes it more likely that by choosing a less neutral way of describing it, they are intending to imply an evaluative connotation. But if you can't find a more descriptive way to put it, then that probably lowers the probability that they're intending to imply something evaluative or normative um, because there's like nothing they could have done to been more neutral about it. Um, and then finally, one last point here. When it comes to the connotations on the words, again, it's going back to what do you think the speaker is evaluating? Are they making an evaluative judgment? Not whether you would make an evaluative judgment about that thing. It's not what you think is good or bad or right and wrong, but what you hear them communicating, right? What message they're trying to get across. Are they trying to indicate their evaluation one way or the other on something? That's the big thing that we're listening for. With conversational implication, there's no way to make an interpretation without using your own background assumptions, but you can kind of check on your own judgments by being like, well, is this, you know, am I, I hate this word, normal, maybe common. Is, is the judgment I'm hearing here something I'd anticipate most people to have as an evaluation? Then that would increase the likelihood of it being an implication because you're not supposed to be implying meanings that only people who are sort of in the inside would be able to get. You know, you're leaving that trail of breadcrumbs, you're hoping an audience picks up on it. If it's a very esoteric trail of breadcrumbs, people won't understand you. Uh, so, so that's one thing you can you can think about. Um, the other thing you can think about is uh, how do I put this? This is this is a more rare contextual based thing, but think about you can you can also kind of. Uh, try to double check your answers by thinking about if there's any evidence or clue here that there would be a motivation or a purpose to uh, the speaker making a normative judgment. So even if in if you looked at just the language that someone used that it kind of like maybe has some evaluative connotation, if you know the context of the conversation is about nothing related to evaluation but purely based on identifying some descriptive states of affairs then even if that language is a little loaded you might not impl you might not treat it as implying an evaluative judgment um, so think about maybe certain professional spaces um, or um, mm, some kind of like highly specific and maybe rigorous conversation about something um, where people are maybe poking fun but it's it, it's really they're speaking loosely but the point is not really to evaluate it's just to indicate the facts um, then you then you might not take that loaded language and the reason why purpose here is something you can use as a context clue is that all implication as we know from Paul Grice depends on some understanding of a cooperative purpose to the communication so for to read the what the person is doing as a conversational act as evaluating would have to kind of make sense for what's happening in the context of the conversation. There can be some weird things that come up here like, in fact there's one of these problems in the homework exercises, where like uh, there's technical medical language for describing certain conditions um, and the intention is not for that language to have an evaluative connotation, but it might still have that evaluative connotation and that's why some people argue for changing the language we use in medical discourse um, to talk about a, I think the example in the homework is an imbalance, a hormonal imbalance. Like that's supposed to be a technical way of just describing a certain condition a patient could be in, but it kind of like throws some extra weight in there of like, this is wrong, right? This is bad. And it might just be something different, right? Like what actual condition that label is assigned to may not necessarily deserve being treated automatically as being bad. So there's things like that of like trying to clean up the language uh, that if we we are just trying to be neutral and not imply any other things, um, even there, even that that might not be the intention of the speaker, it might end up still being the result. 
but those can be some gray areas where people debate like how should we understand this or what do we want to be our linguistic practice going forward. Language, as, as we've talked about before, is messy. It's a moving target. Um, conventions are changing all the time. Different dialects, different uses start to now change the meanings. The dictionary has to be updated every few years because how usage has changed what is really going on with the meaning of that, that particular word or phrase. Okay, um, let me just pause the video for a second and make sure I'm not forgetting anything else, but I think this is pretty good for the uh, catch-up video here to get us moving. Um, I'll be right back. Yep, I think that's it. I think we nailed everything that we needed to talk, that I, I nailed everything I needed to talk about with you. Um, good luck with the homework this weekend, and please let me know if there's anything I can do to help. Don't hesitate to call, even if that's something that feels awkward to you or weird or different, like I've been saying. Um, I mean, we won't get the chance to meet in person and talk until Monday. So if there's something that's that's coming up that'd be like, man, I could really use some help figuring out what I'm supposed to be doing with this thing. Even if it feels weird, I'd encourage you to like maybe just do it or, or send me a text or something like that or whatever you would be comfortable with. But uh, find a way to get a hold of me if you think I can be helpful. I want to be as helpful as I possibly can. Uh, and I'll keep saying that over and over and over again this quarter. But... Um, have a great weekend, and if I don't talk to you, I'll see you on Monday. Thanks for watching the video.